My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, powered by AW360. This is the show about how to choose what you actually want in business and life and how to find the courage to miss out on the rest. My name is Patrick McGinnis, I'm your host, and I'm actually the creator of the term FOMO. I'm coming at you from AW360 Studios in New York City, the city with more FOMO per square inch than any other in the world. And today we're gonna be talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, FOMO and entrepreneurship. I, a couple years ago, wrote a book about how to be an entrepreneur without quitting your day job. And the reason that I wrote that book is that I realized that we are living in a time where it is easier than ever before to start and run a business without quitting your day job. Technology makes starting a business basically free. Uh, 15 years ago, to put up a website, you needed tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Today, it's basically free. And so we see more and more Americans starting businesses on the side. And in fact, 40% of millennials actually have side hustles. It's kind of incredible. I have today in the studio with me the perfect two people to talk about this subject. Um, My guests today are the founders of a company called Market Snacks. Market Snacks is a financial information company, news company for millennials. It has a newsletter and now it has a brand new podcast we'll be talking about. And it basically helps millennials to connect with financial information, get excited about the markets and start investing. The founders of Market Snacks are Nick Martell and Jack Kramer. These guys met in college. Uh, They started this on the side while working in finance. They have gone on to build a real company and now they're everywhere. They're on Cheddar, they're on CBS, and more recently they were chosen uh, as part of Forbes 30 Under 30 in the media category for 2018, which I don't get jealous often, I have to say, pangs of jealousy the day I heard that, but also (laughs) tons of pride in both of the guys. So I want to welcome Jack and Nick here to FOMO Sapiens. Great to be here. Thanks, Patrick. Um, So you guys... This is you know, our first episode we're taping, mm-hmm. and the reason I wanted to bring you in is because you guys are podcast veterans. You've, how many podcasts have you taped at this point? We're almost a week in now. We're yeah. like, this uh, is number five. Is, this is number five. No, so five. basically five <laughs> times more than I've done. <laughs> We've got vast experience here. I mean, you know, we would have put that camera elsewhere, you know, small things like that. Uh, you're fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, so why don't you take me uh, through what is, first of all, how did we meet, Nick? So meet Nick yeah. and I have a good origin story. I, I we love have this. a good origin story, too. Yeah. You already is, told a little bit. This is like superhero origin stories. <laughs> okay. Um, Start with me, and then you tell Jack. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so just purely fortuitous. I mean, this was nuts. We, at the time, I was running Market Snacks as a 10% entrepreneur along with Jack. My day job, I had just left finance. I joined a company called Endeavor. Really fascinating organization that connects entrepreneurs and emerging markets worldwide. We love Endeavor. Endeavor. Great Endeavor. place. Patrick knows it well as a mentor. I was working there. We were at an event in Mexico City, and I'm sitting on a bus on the way to our Endeavor evening event. It was a bus chartered by Endeavor. And I end up, out of 100 people on that bus, sitting next to Patrick. And we start talking, and I say, you know, Patrick, what do you do exactly? And he's like, hey, I just have a book coming out now on 10% entrepreneurship, so individuals with side hustles. And I said, that's perfect. I actually am running one, and I've been running one for the last few years called Market Snacks, and we hit it off from there. And then it was a bus without a roof, and we were standing up, and Nick almost got decapitated. <laughs> yeah. Not a problem for me, <laughs> given the fact that I'm about six inches shorter than you, but you survived. <laughs> no, it was classic Mexico City. You're in the bus. It literally was a two-and-a-half-hour ride to dinner, and um, we barely survived. <clears throat> And how do you, so Jack, you guys, so you guys met in college, right? And you're yeah, freshman year. First of all, Jack's from Vermont, which is a big deal because I'm from Maine. <laughs> and basically that means that we're friends forever. Yeah, we speak the same language. <laughs> and so you guys, you started Market Snacks working in finance. So tell us, tell me about Market Snacks. What does the company do? What's the business model? How do you make money and where are you going with it? Sure. So we started Market Snacks about six months after we both moved into New York after college. And we were both working in finance and we were both kind of, we had two issues. One, we recognized a void in the finance news industry. It was a very tough cookie to crack. You had the Wall Street Journal delivered to your front door every day, but that is a beast. It's so thick, it's so full of jargon. So we knew there must be a better way 
to have financial and business news delivered to you. And we also just really sought a creative outlet. Uh, kind of at the end of the day. Definitely. We were looking for something more than just our day jobs. Wait, so banking didn't feel creative? <laughs> yeah. I'm so confused. It wasn't fulfilling. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so we actually just got together at a bar and we were both kind of just like venting about things that we felt like we were lacking and excited about an opportunity to create something new. So that day we left the bar, we started writing sort of the first blog post really where we covered the news in sort of our own voice as if we were talking with friends. And that was the first Market Snacks, and we haven't stopped since. So our blog became a daily email newsletter. Um, in 2013, we monetized it for the first time, which was very cool, through syndication. And we still do some syndication, but it's mostly monetized through ad sponsorship. Um, we scaled the entire company on the side of our day jobs for about five or six years, actually. And now we continue to scale it while we're both at uh, MBA programs. We really made a commitment this summer, though, to doing this full time for the first time. And with that, we've had some really exciting initiatives. We have more coming out later this summer, the first of which was our daily podcast, Market Snacks Daily, uh, which launched last week, like you mentioned. And it's complementary to the newsletter. Uh, same idea. How can we connect our generation with business and financial news in a way that's accessible, that's fun, that's easy, that covers the stories they care about? Lululemon, Chipotle, understanding the jobs report, not just covering your basic boring earnings reports or what's happening with just interest rates. How does it work? So I I listen to Market Snacks, the podcast. I get the newsletter. I'm a fan because, frankly, I find financial information, even though I worked in finance for many years, like yeah. I don't get the journal. I like the FT. Um, but I, I don't read enough, and so I find that you give me sort of bite-sized pieces of information that are fun and interesting. But what's so interesting, too, is the tone. So we are in this time that's shifting rapidly, right? So much is happening in the world. How do you figure out, I guess, how to adopt a tone that is, that is broad enough that you get a big sort of group of people, but is sort of specific enough that you can feel relevant to your audience. Patrick, you're absolutely right. This was a secret sauce that we basically spent years honing and working on. You have two guys here who have writing styles we had to create one voice with because we're both writing all the daily content. We also had to figure out how are we going to curate the right material. Um, so, you know, you can go through the Wall Street Journal or CNBC or Bloomberg, and you're going to see similar stories pop up every day. How can we find and identify the stories that our generation really cares about and that they can relate to? You know, how do yoga trends affect Lululemon sales and therefore the stock? We want to find that because it's buried and then explain it in an educational but interesting and engaging tone that's also funny and fun you'll enjoy doing and keep it short. That's a real challenge. And so that took a few years for us to work on and hone. And at the same time, we didn't want to come off as two bro finance guys. Yeah, absolutely. I think our mission is twofold. And the blue shirts totally don't give off that. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we're all we wearing blue really... shirts right now. Like, seriously? Yeah, yeah. a little bit of chest hair. <laughs> Can we edit that? Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think our mission is twofold. It's to make um, becoming informed about business and finance easier, but also make it more fun. So you actually look forward to doing it. Um, and I think our, our tone and our voice and kind of including our personality is a way that we make it actually enjoyable. And, and that's something I think we're really proud of having accomplished. You know, you look at our readership, it's, you know, almost 50% female, which is huge in the business and finance news space. And that's because we've created this voice that's very accessible for young professionals, regardless of their background. They're having fun and enjoying getting engaged with business news. So that's something we're really proud of and I think we've, we've accomplished. And we make an effort to be as inclusive as possible. So Nick's not just talking about his lacrosse days and I'm not just talking about my football days. We're finding other perspectives as best we can um, while still being kind of loyal to who we are. Yeah, I guess you know the proof's in the numbers, right? It's true. If you're doing 50-50 demo split in this particular content segment, it's pretty incredible, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's just something that stands out for us and it's a key differentiator for the Market Snacks brand. So you guys started this on the side, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. This is the part that kind of blows my mind. So you're, you've been into this for six years now. Yeah. You started this working in finance jobs, and anybody who's you know worked in finance or been finance adjacent, as I like to say, knows that those are just long hours. But you have dead time in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. But every day, or I guess five days a week, you guys needed to figure out a way to produce a content piece that would go out 
early in the morning, so you probably write it the night before. And this is with people who you guys, you know, you're interesting people. I know Nick, you were traveling all over the place for your job at Endeavor. Jack, I assume you were mostly based in New York, but you probably, you know, you, you were probably in Vermont half the time since, like, <laughs> to visit your family. How did you guys, I mean, did you ever have times where you were like, we just can't do it today? How did you manage to always get the news out in the morning? It's yeah. pretty incredible. We have not missed a single day of market action in six years. Yeah, we have not uh, missed a day, uh, which is pretty incredible. We lean on each other. I mean, Nickel have his ice hockey pond pond hockey <laughs> tournament going on and on that day he'll let me know as far in advance as he can and i'll cover for him uh and the reverse the same when i'm in vermont we've been super strategic to do this and i think this is a one of the things that we really enjoyed about your book 10 percent entrepreneur was how we could you know focus on different systems to make this possible because you can't just start a side hustle you really need to, as a 10% entrepreneur, think thoughtfully about how you're going to manage your time to make it possible. So we were very strategic. And Jack was traveling too. I mean, we have wild stories where I'm on a plane for Endeavor on the way down to Brazil. Jack's on his way back from Germany. And we're trying to coordinate to make sure that the newsletter gets out at 6.30 a.m. the next day. And we're both going to be on flights. And that is a crazy challenge. And <laughs> we can live through that. You know, I'm in South Africa in a place where it barely gets internet, and Jack is, meanwhile, like in Germany. <laughs> yeah, I also think that having a side hustle can be complementary to your day job in ways that you wouldn't expect. Like, for example, I was working at a bank, and pretty much I was just doing sales. And instead of talking about the weather and traffic at the beginning of a conversation, <laughs> I could talk about the news stories that I reported on in Market Snacks, or just the fact that I run this company on the side. And people like to hear about that. And so, it can help your day job. And that's why we really encourage you know, employers that are thinking about whether or not to let their employees have side hustles, definitely do it. It'll keep the employees much more engaged, much more motivated, much more satisfied with their lives, I feel, but also potentially differentiate them from the other people who uh, are making cold calls to I, potential clients. And like, just to quickly touch on some of the you know, efficiencies we found, you know, some of the things we do are we made clear to have a kind of a one and done policy. So we noticed that when it comes to media and content creation, the biggest friction between founders and writers tends to be on the editing process. Someone writes something, it's very personal to them, someone else edits it, they take offense to that. <laughs> Jack and I had a system where we're like, all right, Jack, if I write something about Chipotle and it's stupid, just edit that thing out. And if Jack writes something about tariffs, I'm like, dude, this doesn't make any sense. I'll edit it. Why does he have no to write the hard feelings. stuff about tariffs? You're able to pull it. That's the other strategic thing. <laughs> well, then that's the other element is we noticed very complementary skill sets. So we said, all right, to be more efficient and to make sure that we can scale this, I'm going to write about certain topics consistently, and Jack will write other, about other topics consistently. And that's allowed us to be able to eliminate time where we would go back and forth and say, hey, do you want to write this? Do you want to write that? Do you like taking the one on the jobs report? Do you want to take the one on Facebook's earnings? So that's a, a nice efficiency we worked in as well. Let me go back to what Jack said because this yeah. is one of my big, I mean, this is like the fight that I'm fighting and my, my big uphill journey here is that most companies don't want their employees to have side jobs, which is really ironic because the one company that loves this and has been really supportive and had me to speak a bunch of times is Google, which by the way is bigger than all the other companies <laughs> depending on the day, right? But many companies, especially companies that are traditional, are threatened by the idea that their employees might have some interest that lies outside of their four walls. You just mentioned that there's a benefit to this. Did you find that there was pushback from your employer? Did you ever have any issues with the fact that you had, you know, you were, this was not, you weren't sort of hiding behind the curtain. This was something that was very much imbued with your personality and that you were involved with, right? Well, we weren't fully disclosed from the uh, start. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we actually had probably 18 months or so. Sometimes you got to ask for forgiveness, not permission. Yeah, so yeah. We, we started Market Snacks anonymously, didn't have our name on the website. But finally, we, we realized this was, this was something we were going to continue. And we should, we should disclose this to our, to our bosses. And so it was nice to be able to point to our track record of being you know, high-performing people at our day jobs and being able to articulate how... Our side hustle, you know, might even have benefited us in some ways. Mm. That was really early on, though. I, we were chatting earlier. You know, I don't think the term side hustle had even been, was even in the parlance back then. Now, I think the benefits are a little bit more tangible. But, yeah, change is tough for old companies. But I would really say that the trends are that, you know, we hear all, all the time that millennials want meaning in their jobs. Some jobs, it's tough to find meaning. And so if your employees are able to find it in another way, that'll also 
give them a little bit of more money in their pocket and alleviate you know, the fact that they couldn't get a raise last year, it sounds like everybody wins. I think a key here too is communication. And this is what I found working at Endeavor, which is an entrepreneur focused organization is they were okay with the idea of us doing market snacks as 10% entrepreneurs and as a side hustle. Um, when we started scaling and getting into TV content, Jack and I got into this funny situation where we would go down to do a TV hit for like Cheddar or go uptown to CBS to do a TV hit as like a millennial voice on the markets at like 8 or 8.30 in the morning and we'd have makeup on and a suit and then we'd have to run back to work with like wiping makeup off our face in the bathroom and that's the kind of thing that like people are going to notice and the immediate question is, does this interfere with your core day job responsibilities. I think we did a good job of proactively coming to our firms and saying, hey, this is something we want to do. It benefits the company because it's something we can engage in and maybe also promote the company as well. It's something that makes us more well-rounded employees. And by over-communicating that and letting them know when we'd be appearing on TV and how that wouldn't interfere with our day jobs, they let us do it and we continue to kind of grow that. I think I, I totally agree with you. Mm-hmm. What I always tell people is play by the rules, mm-hmm. respect your employer, you know, treat them with a lot of respect because if you don't do a good job at your day job, then there's no side job at all because you're just <laughs> going to be unemployed looking for help, right? right? So it sounds like you also did that. But this is, uh, this is something that we're going to talk about in lots of episodes of FOMO Sapiens. It's this idea that the world has changed, yeah. employers, a train has left the station, right. and you, know, you may not be comfortable with it, but if you think through it, it's actually a very powerful retention tool. Absolutely. And, right? You can become an employer of choice and build loyalty with this young demographic that you know, no one has been able to crack. Like, do do you guys I have side hustles it. right now, by the way? Uh, <laughs> We're side hustling the side hustles. <laughs> That's what I, that, that'll be, because that, 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 we should find, Pretty we'll, meta. we'll find something to do together. But, um, <laughs> I want to switch gears a little bit, which is, there's another topic that's often um, brought up when we talk about 10% entrepreneurship, side mm-hmm. hustles, whatever you want to call it. And by the way, I want to, I want to make a specific clarification here. When I think of the side hustle, so I almost, I was my, my lovely publisher, Penguin Books, who I deeply love, wanted me to call my book The Side Hustle at one point, interestingly enough. And as I did research on that term, I realized a side hustle could be driving for Uber, right? Mm-hmm. right? Which is, which is, which is yeah. totally fine. There's, there's no issue with the gig economy. Or being a babysitter. But right? you own none of the intellectual property or the equity that you create. Being a 10% entrepreneur is about being an owner. You guys are creating a business that you could very easily sell one day, um, and hopefully for millions and millions or, of dollars. But when we talk about these 10% entrepreneurship projects, one pushback that I get, and I had this convert, I went to this this new hotel, the, um, it's not the Stan Hope Hotel, it's the Stan something hotel. Oh. Um, the other night, this very cool restaurant, I'm talking to this Russian woman who has a entrepreneurial venture. And she said to me, how could I ever do anything on the side? If you either have to go in all in and suffer for this, or you basically aren't really being an entrepreneur. And you guys are showing a totally different way of doing things, which is doing it on the side. Mm -hmm. What is the trade-off that you have to make? Do you ever find people don't take you seriously? Like, How do you think about the fact for six years you have been doing this on the side? Yeah, I think... It, 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 you definitely see how this can be interpreted by different people. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, you get this credibility of, I can't believe you're able to grow a business outside of your day jobs, which is the perspective you know, maybe friends, family, people you meet have. On the other hand, when you're going to a partner like Fidelity, uh, in one case, who we had partnered with on some exciting things, um, the first question is, okay, if you're doing this as a side hustle, how do we know we're getting our money's worth? You know, how are you really you know, having a legitimate business here if you're not doing it full time? So you have to be strategic in terms of how you place it and make sure you're emphasizing it in the correct way. So to your friends and family, say, yeah, we're excited and we're proud to be doing this as a side hustle. Thank you so much for the support. To potential partners who are giving you a lot of money to partner on an exciting project, you have to show them, hey, we have a track record. You can commit to us because we've committed to you. And Jack and I take that very personally. And it's one thing we've kind of found to be a competitive advantage is we We'll call our partners. We proactively give them updates on what we're doing. We share with them all the data on the partnership to make sure they're fully informed. So we found that we have to go that extra step to show partners Mm -hmm. that we're not only, you know, maybe at the time we were a side hustle, but we're 100% committed to making sure they're happy with the project. Yeah. And do you feel like there's a kind of a marketing benefit to being sort of a side hustle? Do you ever have people that actually find the story more? I mean, I do find it more interesting, obviously, but... Besides me, <laughs> is this can there be an advantage to this? Yeah, I think Forbes magazine found. All right, 
that this was a differentiator in our story. And the fact that we were able to do what we've done with Market Snacks while scaling, you know, while being high performers on Wall Street, that was a total differentiator for us. And it's kind of a new idea of like taking a risk because entrepreneurship is about like kind of risk taking in many ways, right? And I was a part-time entrepreneur, but I also worked at a Wall Street bank. Like that's the least like risky uh, thing you can imagine. <laughs> actually, so, these days, depending yeah. on the bank. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's kind of a, a, a unique identity we found for ourselves that work great in my life. It's mm. been incredibly fulfilling. Um, it's given us media exposure. Um, yeah. It's it's got us to the MBA program we're at, and it's it had. Now the downside is that the scaling of Market Snacks definitely came at a more slow pace. You know, Nick and I would happily accept that any minute to admit that. Um, but it's been at a pace that has been so personally fulfilling, and now we're at a position that we're kind of ramping it up a little, and it's a really exciting time. Yeah, I mean, when you're a side hustle entrepreneur, it's Jack and I pour our heart and soul into the business development, the content creation, and growth of the brand. But that means we couldn't focus on marketing or social media. So we've, you know, what's made us want to commit to Market Snacks full time is the exciting growth we've seen purely organically, word of mouth, and then through our own press and media coverage that's been generated organically. And to see how much the company has grown just from that, it's shown us when you go full hustle on it, You know, it's like tapping gasoline that hadn't been lit yet. I mean, we're excited about yeah, that. Yeah, the and proof that's of saying. concept is so solid right? Yeah. from what we've done as side hustle entrepreneurs. Yeah. So it's it's so just confidence and excitement. You know, it's why we launched a daily podcast last week. And, you know, we're excited because we're seeing the results from that already. Yeah, so let's talk about I want to touch on the podcast because, yeah. you know, all the cool kids are having podcasts right now. <laughs> At least everybody in this room yeah. is doing uh, <laughs> a podcast. <laughs> um, so that's three. But... How do you, I mean, what have you learned? So I need advice. You guys, you smart. Give me, what have you learned in your three episodes so far? <laughs> what should I be doing? So you've been here for 23 minutes. Yeah. What should we be doing differently here? Like what, what, you yeah. know, what, what are they, what, why did you do this? Like what kind of drove you to the podcast? Well, well first of all, wear a blue shirt. So okay. Guys, well, <laughs> good, good there. Well, and the other thing is, you know, you have, your, the core product's already here that makes this successful, which is the banter, the fun, and the conversation. And I think that when you look at any successful podcast, that's the key. And that's what, I don't know, the last 23 and a half minutes I've been enjoying. And I think that's the key to scaling any podcast is you want that fun conversation. And I've been having fun with it. Yeah, I think relatability and having a conversation with the audience is is a differentiator. And for us, we kind of have like a personality-driven business and finance news podcast. So we script it like as little as possible. Yeah. Um, but we also try to leverage kind of the work that we do to create the newsletter um, to make the to make the podcast more efficient. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple things we do. When you're passionate about something, um, for us, it's making business news accessible to all. We get testimonials every day from readers and listeners saying, I finally got this job on Wall Street because I listen to Market Snacks, or I finally feel like I understand what's happening in business news and can chat with my friends about it in a fun way and lead a conversation. To us, that's fulfilling. It drives us. We're passionate about it. So we can get on the mics and just chat about business stories and have fun with it. It's the same with you in this podcast. I mean, you're passionate about the ideas of what makes entrepreneurs tick, what makes people have FOMO, and how does that relate to their careers and their growth. Um, And then with 10% entrepreneurship, how you can have a fulfilling career and business while pursuing something uniquely and different. And when you're passionate about it and have a conversation like this, Mm -hmm. it's a successful podcast. Thank you. Wow. I feel like I, I feel you know a little bit better than I did uh, earlier today. <laughs> uh, I want to switch gears now yeah. to, so you guys are both in your MBA programs, mm-hmm. which is awesome. Number one, um, I, it's interesting. People are a little skeptical these days about the MBA programs, I find. I've had certain friends who I say, well, are you thinking about doing an MBA? I did an MBA. I thought it was very valuable. Um, not for everybody, but uh, it's definitely, uh, there's been some pushback, especially the fact that we've been, I guess, in what, nine years of a boom economy. Mm-hmm. Um, when we are in a riding a wave, people don't want to take time away. Um, what did you, so was this a FOMO-driven decision to do the MBA or what, what kind of got you guys to do this? First of all, I, I think having the MBA experience has been powerful, fulfilling, and exciting. And what people don't talk about enough, I think, incredibly challenging. That first semester totally kicked my butt. <laughs> I mean, that was really hard. Um, Jack's, at, uh, Jack's at the Ross School of Business at Michigan. I'm at Warden at University of Pennsylvania. And we've managed to also scale a business wall in these programs, which has had an extra layer of challenge to it, but also, I think, made it twice as much as more fulfilling because we're literally taking in real time what we're learning in class and putting it right back into the business. I mean, I would get out of a marketing class and call Jack and be like, 
hey, Jack, have we thought about like breaking down the numbers like this when we're considering different marketing options? And he's like, I literally just took a class on this last week and I have a spreadsheet ready to go that was covering it. So for us, it's been able to apply things in real time. That's been really fun. Yeah, for me, working at the big bank I worked at and working at Market Snacks was a very interesting juxtaposition. It was so much more fun kind of <laughs> doing your own thing. And at the big bank, I learned kind of sales and sort of bona fide like financial analysis. But to be more well-rounded and to be able to have the option to be a full-time entrepreneur and sort of determine my own direction as an entrepreneur, I needed more skills. And I couldn't agree more with Nick. My MBA program is tough. I mean, classes are hard. I think a lot of times you hear that the MBA program is just about the network that you build. The network's huge, but the classes are extremely challenging and I've learned so many things. Um, you know, marketing, strategy. Strategy, um, yeah. Strategy's uh, been big about how we place market snacks, even think about the content we do. And also the people we've met. I mean, Jack and I had uh, lunch the other day with one of Jack's classmates, um, and I'm seeing one of mine tomorrow. And we found that the people you meet at MBA programs are such a supportive, exciting group. I mean, we get texts all the time, like when we launched Market Snacks Daily, the podcast last week, we're getting texts from our MBA classmates you know, immediately on this. So it's an incredible amount of support, and these are people who are just fun. You learn so much from them. Their backgrounds are incredible. I mean, it's just a great group to be with. I totally loved my program as well. Yeah. But I also suffered from massive FOMO and something called FOBO, uh -huh. which is fear of a better option. So for those mm -hmm. of you who, have, who don't know the story behind FOMO and FOBO, and I mm -hmm. think you guys do, when I was a student at Harvard Business School, I wrote an article making fun of all of my classmates and I because of this FOMO and FOBO that I observed. FOMO, fear of missing out. FOBO, fear of a better option. The idea that we're all trying to do everything we can to keep up with our classmates, but at the same time, we're also collecting options and maybe not deciding. So I'm sure you, yeah. you guys both mm -hmm. lived in New York before. You've seen the classic <laughs> Friday night flake where yeah. you've got your friend who's you know got seven different sets yeah. of plans, and then you you know you're coming in like second or third on the list, and they just <laughs> and don't you show up. You can tell. Oh, yeah. Guy. yeah. Uh, everybody, I mean, we all have that. It's that ex friend, right? Because, yeah. you know, who has, it kills relationships over time. But yeah. do you see, in, you know, in your programs an enhanced level of FOMO and FOBO vis a vis your lives before mm -hmm. um, going to the MBA programs? <laughs> so it's funny. It's like almost impossible not to have FOMO at business school because there's so much stuff going on. You're getting texts about this speaker coming in one day. You know, you've got, um, <laughs> You've literally got the former CEO of Apple coming in one day, and then you've got, oh, but at the same time, there is... You got the Amazon case competition. Right. Everyone <laughs> wants to get the internship with Amazon. And then there's a flight going out because someone's, you know, planned a last-minute trek to Japan to meet with business leaders that you could jump and on. And the like, Entrepreneur Club is looking for new VPs, right. which and, would look real nice on your resume. And this is all at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's impossible not to feel that FOMO at first, but we were talking about this a lot before in, in preparation for this podcast, and... There are a few different things we found that help you manage that because in reality, you almost shouldn't have FOMO with it because you know that you can't do it all. And I think that there's a sense of peace that comes. Uh, I, I found this from an executive coach we had at Warden who I was talking with who said, look, the reality is whether you're choosing between which blue shaded shirt you're going to put on in the morning or whether or not you're going to do one of these great MBA program opportunities, you're going to have a regret. And once you realize and recognize that regrets are inevitable, it kind of helps you come to peace with them and say, okay, no matter what, I'm going to have this feeling, so let's not embolden it and let it have an impact on my life. So just go with whatever option makes the most sense. And don't worry about fearing about the other options because they're inevitable no matter what. You're always going to have that, even if you made the right choice or the wrong choice. Words of wisdom from Nick Martel. <laughs> All right, guys, so um, tell us where we can find Market Snacks, you, um, how we can sort of get involved in the community. Well, it's an exciting community to be a part of, and we have even more coming out for the Market Snacks community this summer, which we're really excited about. Um, but to start, we go to the website, marketsnacks.com, subscribe, put in your email address so you can get the daily email newsletter. It's our core product, breaking down the business and finance news of the day to make it fun, interesting, and easy. And then you can check out the podcast. Yeah, our podcast is so much fun. It takes 15 to 20 minutes, so it's perfect for... I have a shower radio. Do you have a shower radio? No, I want to. Well, afterwards, you can show me how to get one because I really want one. It's so empowering, you know, Ooh. using those moments in the shower instead of the shampoo. It's the perfect time to listen to business and finance news. Uh, the time of our podcast is, is perfect for the shower when you're getting ready, uh, when you're working out, or on your commute. 
and like you'll really have fun. We'll break down the top two or three business and finance news stories. We'll say what it means for the company that the news story was about or what it means for you personally. And we'll give you kind of concrete takeaways that you can go out and use in your job or use when you're talking to people at dinner uh, or use at the weekend for conversation starters. And, you know, business and finance is so important. Um, it's driving politics. You know, corporate CEOs are taking leadership roles in society now, uh, filling the void that kind of politics in Washington has created. Business and finance, you need to know. And we make it accessible in a really fun way. And, yeah. You can just go to Apple, iTunes. You can go to Stitcher. You can go Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Just yeah. click subscribe. And it comes out every morning, uh, both the newsletter and the podcast. And then you got to rate it. you got to rate the podcast. Please. <laughs> because that yeah. drives. I mean, this is one of those things. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much, Nick Martell, Jack Kramer. Um, so... I'm a big fan of Market Snacks. That's why I had these guys in here. Not just because they built their business part-time, which is near and dear to my heart, but because I actually do actually use the product and I really like it. So if you're interested in the market, you don't have to be a millennial, although um, it might help you understand some of the lingo they drop in their podcast and in their daily email. And with that, I want to wrap up. Um, thanks for joining us today. If you want to find out more about FOMO Sapiens, find out more about part-time entrepreneurship, or find out more about me, you can go to my website, www.patrickmcginnis.com, where you'll have all kinds of information, links to all my social, and anything else you could ever want in the world of FOMO. Thanks for joining, and I'll see you next time on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO.